Another episode of Words of Grace starts now, featuring a new grace-filled message each week as Acts 433 Church brings the gospel to you through the teaching ministry of Dr. Matthew Webster. It's great to be with you as we start on a brand new series together entitled Grace Killers. We're going to look at the various things that would prevent us from receiving the grace that God desires to give us in our lives. Now, to be very clear, there is a, a grace that God will provide no matter what to believers and non-believers alike. Like the very air that we breathe is a gift of God's grace. The fact that you woke up this morning and got to enjoy God's creation, that is a gift of his grace as well. But there are things that we'll see as we get into the Word. There are certain things the enemy would try to put on us that would hinder us from receiving a certain kind of grace that God desires to give to us. So in today's message on is on the grace killer known as pride. Whether you were prideful or not doesn't take away what is known as the common grace that God has given you. And I just talked about that earlier. Common grace is the air that we breathe, uh, enjoying this beautiful creation, things like that. I wish that they would come up with a better term than common grace, because that sounds uh, confusing. I know they mean common to all, but I just find what is common to mankind that comes from God is still remarkable. And so God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, Having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. He supplies it, and today, through this series, we're going to receive it. Amen. The psalmist would write, The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Psalm 145.9 Jesus said, that God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous in Matthew 5, 45. You know, his sermon on the mount, his famous sermon. And also we find in Luke 6, 35, that God is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Barnabas and Paul would later say, say the same thing. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy, Acts 14, 17. And so in addition to his compassion, his goodness, and his kindness, God also displays his patience upon believers and non-believers alike. The prophet Nahum says that God still exercises long-suffering towards those whom he has not chosen. Nahum, Nahum 1 3. Every breath that the wicked takes is an example of the mercy of our holy God. So, when we're talking about grace killers, the things that will prevent us from receiving God's grace, the grace He wants to give us, we're not talking about common grace. No, we're going to talk about something else that's known as special grace. Special grace is a term that theologians put together. It's not written in Scripture as such, but they had to find a way to label this, this grace to uh, differentiate between the common grace that we have and the special grace that's available only to believers. And so it's special grace, the definition is bestowed on only those whom God elects, those are believers, whom God elects to eternal life through faith in Jesus. It's the grace in which God redeems, sanctifies, and glorifies his people. So let's go to our text and discover what I mean and what theologians mean when they refer to special grace. So we'll be in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 6. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Now, Peter is quoting from Proverbs 3, 34 here when he said that last part. And then he, he continues with, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, 
that he may lift you up in due time. God resists the proud. We see this over and over again with Jesus' interaction with the proud Pharisees. It isn't that God doesn't uh, love the Pharisees. That's not the case at all. The resistance that God does provides the opportunity for the proud to be humbled, to consider a, a better way in which they'll actually receive God's grace. That's his desire for everybody, that they would receive that which they haven't earned and therefore don't deserve. All of you, the text tells us, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So whose prayers are hindered? That's a great question. It's those who boast, thank you God that I'm not like that other person. That's Luke 18, 11. It's those who see themselves as being better than others, those who are proud. That's who God resists. It's those who sacrifice people on the altar of their convictions. Such people have trouble receiving grace because they don't see their own need for it. Their pride actually hinders their prayers. Pride will hinder you from receiving the grace that God wants to give you. That's what Peter's saying in 1 Peter 5, 5. And so what difference does grace make? So here we have uh, Saul before he became Paul. Saul as the Pharisee and then Paul as the apostle. So before Saul has his conversion on the road to Damascus, where he actually encounters Jesus Christ, here's Saul. He says, Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God and King, who has not made me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. That was his attitude. That was the spirit Saul had. And then after his conversion, and he became Paul, there he, he wrote, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. Grace made all the difference in Paul's life. Before he met the Lord of grace, the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee, and he would have prayed that prayer that was on the left. We see this in the Talmud, uh, volume 4. But this is a prideful prayer. Pray like that, and your prayers will be hindered. Because religion, in this case, what it does, uh, pride kills grace, and it will hinder prayers. Performance-based religion says that if you deliver the goods, if you avoid sin and you behave yourself, well, then you get a direct line to God. It's not true. What you'll get is just a mirror to admire yourself. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all that I have. Luke 18, 12. Do you really think that God is impressed with your sacrifice when you are not impressed with His? God doesn't bless us in accordance with our output. That's not how grace works. But in accordance with the riches of His grace. And that is why religious superstars, and I, I say that, um, you know, religious superstars, there's no such thing, but these religious superstars are often the ones who are further from God's grace than even the tax collectors and the prostitutes. We see that in Matthew 21, 31. So Paul Ellis, uh, who I consider a, a mentor, as I just love his writings, great website, escapetoreality.org. He says, how do we unhinder our prayers? Well, remove the pride by being humble. Finally, all of you, Live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. 1 Peter 3.8 It's easy to be humble with the Lord, but Peter exhorts us to be humble with each other. That's a lot harder to do. Wives to husbands, husbands to wives, uh, you know, siblings to each other, family members to one another us to our neighbor, uh, everybody. 
To quote C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis said, Humility isn't thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It's being compassionate. It's being loving to one another. This is a key for receiving God's grace. Because God's grace uh, flows to us through people and from us to other people as well. Do you want more grace in your marriage? We all, no matter how wonderful your marriage is, you should say, yes, I want more grace in my marriage. Then thank God that he has blessed you with a partner in grace. Want more grace in your family? I do. We all should. Then thank God for your kids who are co-heirs in Christ. Do you want to see more grace in your church? Then clothe yourself with humility toward one another and praise Him for surrounding you with such towering testimonies of His grace. Who are you thanking God for today? In the text, God desires for us to be lifted up, and that is what humility brings us to. John Bunyan said, He that is down needs to fear no fall. He that is low, no pride. He that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. I love that quote. Because pride, what it does is it looks at self-efforts. Humility says, look at what Christ has done for me. On the Mount of Transfiguration, after the voice of God came, God our Father came from heaven, he told the three disciples, he said, listen to the voice of my son. And this is what Jesus had to say to them in Matthew 17, 7. Arise and do not be afraid. It's not a commandment. It's not a law. What we hear there is we hear the voice of grace. In the Greek, the words arise and do not be afraid are in the active voice and the passive voice. And what that means, the active voice means you are the one who is doing it. The passive voice means it's being done to you or for you. In the passive voice, you are not the one who is doing it. And so the word arise, which would lift us up, it's in the passive voice. It's not about us bringing ourselves up through pride. It's allowing God to lift us. What Jesus is telling his disciples is allow yourself to be lifted by God. True humility is when you allow the voice of grace to lift you up. God shows favor to the humble because the humble are those who have received His Son. And when you are lifted, allowing Jesus' finished work to do this for you, which is humility, you realize that you stand on equal ground with Jesus because you have been given His righteousness. Jesus died to give you His standing. And there is no pride in this at all. Everything God desires to give to you is available through Jesus. Pride, what it does is it says, no thanks, I'm good, I got this. God opposes this attitude. This shuts down the pipeline of his special grace unto us. The grace that grows us. The grace that makes us more and more like his son. The story is told of two women in Shanghai who were discussing the topic of pride. And they began to wonder if Hudson Taylor, this great missionary to China, if he was ever tempted to be prideful because he accomplished so much in his life. One of the women decided to ask Hudson Taylor's wife, Maria, about it. And so Maria promised the woman that she would find out. And so when Mrs. Taylor asked her husband if he was ever tempted to be proud, he was surprised by the question. He said, proud about what? About you know, all those things that you've done, his wife explained. Taylor responded, I never knew that I had done anything. 
This was the same guy during his 51 years of service uh, in the China Inland Mission established 20 mission statements. He brought 968 missionaries to the field. He trained over 700 Chinese workers and he raised $4 million at that time by faith. And he developed a witnessing church that shared the gospel and they had over 125,000 members. It's been said that 35,000 people were led to faith by Hudson Taylor alone and that he would go on and baptize over 50,000 people. Yet his words were out of humility. I never knew that I did anything because he said that this was a work of God. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's jump to another text to get an even fuller picture of the grace killer known as pride. So we're going to go to James chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That sounds a lot like what Peter said, doesn't it? Because both men just quoted from Proverbs 3, 34, to show how important this is. But leading up to this verse, the reason I went to James is he's going to hammer home the point of how destructive and how dangerous pride is. Pride brings with it strife. It brings with it division. It brings with it wars. It, it, so listen to what James has to say. He says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and you covet and you cannot obtain. You fight and you war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. That is humility, to ask God for something that is for the kingdom. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. So when these people are asking God for something, it's not in compassion and kindness towards other people. They're only thinking of themselves, how they could just uh, have pleasure from it. It's the opposite of what Peter said about being sympathetic, compassionate, and humble to others. Think about and pray for other people. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Some hard words to pronounce, some old school words there. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you not think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? But then here we have it. But he gives more grace. The Greek word for, for more is megas. And it means he gives us abundant grace. Pride leads to wars and fights, lust and murder. But the opposite is God who gives to us abundant grace. And so we have this opportunity every day, all the time. We can choose to be proud or we can choose to receive abundant grace. Ultimately, the message that I just read is what cost James his life. In A.D. 62, James was condemned by the Sanhedrin for breaking the law. The law livers, they had a knowledge of the law, but what does knowledge alone do? Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, Knowledge puffs up, makes us prideful, but love builds up. The true test is not how much you know, but how much you love. The historical records tell us that they actually would take James to the top of the temple in order that he would renounce Christ. When he didn't do it, they threw him off the temple. With his dying breath, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In death, 
as in life, James exhibited amazing, abundant grace. And those words should sound very familiar because that is the very spirit of Christ in him. The very words of Jesus on the cross. So I want to bring this home to you today. When you wake up every morning, would you pray, Lord, I want to, I, Lord, I see your supply of grace. I see it flowing to me right now in my life. I want us to visualize that. Your grace flowing to my life today is more than enough for every single demand that I will face. Have you ever heard of the principle of supply and demand before? Have you ever had a business class? I'm sure that you've heard of it. I want to give you an illustration for this with, with grace and what it means to live under God's grace. So when you are conscious, when you pray and, and you say, Lord, I thank you for your grace. I see your supply coming to me now. When you're conscious of God's constant supply of his grace to you, you are living under grace. Conversely, when you are conscious instead of the demands, just focused on everything that you've got to do, everything that's put on you, all the pressures to achieve and succeed and, and have uh, success, when you're focused on the demands instead of the supply, you are living under the law. Simply put, the, princ the principle of grace is supply, while the principle of the law is demand. The law says you shall and you shall not over and over again. It's demanding of us. But under grace, God says, I will, I will, I will. That's Hebrews 8, 10 through 12. Can you see the difference that under grace, God is the one that's doing all the supplying, not us. And praise God that our relationship with Him is in the new covenant of grace. When you are demand-oriented, when we get to be that, at that place, and it happens to all of us, and so don't feel guilty or condemned when that happens. No, instead, I want you to see what God has provided for you in Christ. But when we get to those places where we're just so stressed, we just focus on the demand instead. I must do this. I must do that. It depends on me. The result is you'll be stressed and you'll, be, uh, you'll feel this pressure to perform and meet people's expectations and achieve results. But when you are living under grace, you see the rich supply that is being provided to you from God. So it doesn't matter what the situation is that you face, the demands that are on you. God is supplying you the grace that you need. The result is you will walk in peace. And you'll always see God's provision because your eyes are focused on His unfailing supply to you. You are allowing yourself to be lifted by God. Remember, you can't do that yourself. It's in the passive voice. You recognize it as Christ is, so are we in this world. The reason pride is a grace killer is that pride will take our focus off of our supply, Jesus Christ, and it will only focus on the demand that is placed upon us. Our part is just to exercise faith, receive from God the supply of gr grace that he wants to give to you. When you realize that it's all about God's love and his undeserved favor toward you, you'll be thanking God all of the time instead of being stressed and complaining about the demands that are on you today. You'll be at rest and you'll have more than enough that will actually be able to focus on being compassionate and kind and humble to other people. My friends, may we all choose to live in the realm of God's constant supply of grace and his lavish love that he has for us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this powerful word. 
the enemy wants to get our minds and all the demands and what we must do and nothing will happen unless we do this and we do that. Instead of starting our mornings off by saying, God, I thank you, you are giving me all the grace, abundant grace for what I need, for what is on me today. We allow ourselves to be lifted by God. It gives us rest. It gives us such peace. And we're able to live as you desire us to live, as we're receiving your grace. We're kind. We're compassionate. We're humble towards others. And this is exactly how Christ is. And he enables us to live. So I thank you for this word. I pray that those who are under stress, those who are under great pressure today, will take their eyes off of that and put it on your son and see that you are giving them everything they need because you love them so much. I thank you for your supply of special grace that you give us through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.